Um, I'm giving a talk later uh, to IBEC, and the opening line of the speech is, uh, we're at a defining moment uh, in the history of the European Union. It occurred to me that I can't remember how many speeches over the last 30 years I've given, which began with those same lines, because it seems to me that we're always, uh, we have as many defining moments as we had in, in the European Union, as we had windows of opportunity in, in Geneva for the Doha development agenda. Uh, but it, it is... It's, it's still true. Uh, sometimes uh, the cliché is, is true. Uh, and I'm conscious that much of the focus is uh, about the choice of personalities, the whole spitzen gandon debate. Uh, and these, these, are, these are certainly very important. Uh, uh, and I'm also conscious that probably after the European Parliament elections, uh, a sense of um, unhappiness with the, the, the way things are going in Europe, uh, uh, people are also very focused on you know, it's the economy, stupid, uh, jobs and growth agenda. Uh, and this is, this is very important. But today I would also like to make the case that, unfortunately, uh, we have to walk and chew gum. Uh, we have to also keep a very close eye on the international agenda, uh, which is, frankly, at the present time, rather disturbing, uh, and which will have profound implications for uh, our internal uh, situation over the years. Uh, in the next next few years, and which will have to be addressed. So I don't think that we can actually just focus on uh, one agenda of domestic uh, uh, concern, of growth, jobs, uh, employment, very important and crucial as these things will be, but I think we're also going to have to keep a very close eye on, on the international environment. Uh, I... Uh, a colleague said as I was coming in why, why I wasn't giving setting up the EAS part three because I think I, I bored you to death with uh, lengthy descriptions of the travails of setting up the external action series, service uh, in two episodes. Um, mainly because I'm, I'm sort of here to say, well, the job is done. I mean, in the sense that the service is there and it exists. And fortunately, I don't have to answer endless questions about the compatibility of IT systems or uh, the, the recruitment of national diplomats into the External Action Service. Um, but equally, uh, I, I think uh, not only is the job done, but I think we have also uh, had to address uh, a wide range of, of issues, as you said, Mary, while we were setting up this service. Uh, the world has not stood still, as it unfortunately tends not to do while we get ourselves uh, in, in shape in Europe. And this is something we could perhaps come back to. Um, let me just mention three areas of, of great change that we've witnessed over the last four years. Um, the political transformation in our neighborhood uh, has been completely remarkable and frankly also unexpected. Uh, if you look at the, the Balkans, where the slow process of transformation and mediation is bringing a new hope of stability to the region, even if there are still problems. But if we look at North Africa, where entire populations have been overthrowing long entrenched regimes, but now face difficult and long transitions and with very uneven uh, progress uh, across the region. Uh, at the same time, the tectonic plates of geopolitics are shifting. After Iraq and Afghanistan, and in line with the, the pivot to the Pacific policy, decision makers and public opinion in the US are certainly wary of military intervention in Europe's neighborhood and the speech of Robert Gates when he was leaving uh, the role of Secretary of Defense to the, the NATO uh, was, could not have been clearer in terms of saying that the US expected Europe to shoulder a, a much greater part of the responsibility for uh, uh, the security of, of, our, of our region. Uh, and recent events have shown that relations with Russia, which we had been a, a key a cornerstone of our policy over the last uh, 25, 30 years, uh, uh, have also uh, been completely upturned uh, with a much more assertive and unpredictable uh, Russia. Uh, China has renewed territorial claims and disputes that we had thought uh, had been buried under the economic success of East Asia and South Asia have suddenly resurfaced with frankly, some rather graphic and surprising language being used by, by very senior politicians uh, in the region, which uh, with echoes of uh, recrimination about the Second World War, which frankly, I think many of us never thought we would hear spoken again, uh, certainly not in, in the 21st century. On the positive side, we do see an increasing awareness of how tightly knit our global societies have become and of the need to look collectively at fighting cross-border threats such as the spreading of the financial crisis, 
the nefarious effects of climate change, the scourge of terrorism and piracy, or even the challenge of migration, which is uh, uh, an increasingly challenging issue uh, in, in, in Europe, certainly, but also elsewhere. And the reality is that multilateral solutions to these problems, which is probably what we would, as a reflex, prefer, uh, become, if anything, more elusive. Now, uh, over the past five years, as Mary said, the EU has redesigned its institutions to improve its ability to act globally and has engaged in new and deeper ways in most of the major global crises. Firstly, at the institutional level, we have redesigned and strengthened our ability to act externally through the Lisbon Treaty, which ushered in some very big institutional innovation in the way that Mary has described. Uh, and I'm not going to uh, repeat what Mary has already said. Uh, we set up the External Action Service as the support to the new role of the uh, High Representative Vice President. Of course, we decided that that was the title that Cathy's role would take rather than Foreign Minister, which might have been slightly more comprehensible. And frankly, when I have to introduce myself as the Chief Operating Officer of the European External Action Service, uh, there is a distinct risk that my interlocutors fall asleep before I finished uh, <laughs> completing the, the sentence. Someone asked me last night, uh, or I was talking to, to someone, said, why was it called the European External Action Service? And I had to confess, I fear the answer was to make us sound as unimportant as possible. Uh, <laughs> um, but it now exists. Uh, it's in its fourth year of existence, and I think we have demonstrated that it is possible to combine the strengths and, and personnel of the Commission, the Council, National Diplomatic Services, and thanks to the work of Catherine Ashton, the and I must say the trust of President Barroso and Van Rompuy, and I must emphasize the strong support from member states. Uh, uh, the one thing which has been a revelation to me coming into this job from you know, 30 odd years, some very odd years uh, of working in the Commission, uh, has been the strong sense of solidarity of member state foreign ministries with this process. And frankly, they could have reacted slightly differently. They could have taken a slightly different view that somehow this new bureaucratic creation in Brussels was a threat. I think maybe some of them think that privately. Maybe when I'm not in the room, they talk like that amongst themselves. I don't think so. And certainly it's not the way they've acted, whether it was in the remarkable transformation of the commission delegations into EU delegations, which happened more or less at the flick of a switch uh, at one minute past midnight, uh, uh, in 2009, uh, or whether that has been uh, the, the whole challenges of personnel, policy, budget, and everything else, where I must say the member states could not have been more loyal or more supportive, and this has also strongly contributed to our ability uh, to put the service together in, in a relatively short period of time. We've also strengthened our capacity to respond to crisis around the world and to put together crisis management missions and operations where we mobilize over 7,000 EU military and civilian personnel in around 30 missions, which we've launched over the past decade. And our strength lies, I believe, in a comprehensive approach, enabling us to combine diplomatic, political, military, trade, development, and humanitarian actions. So if you like, the, the instrument has been built. The, I think the phrase I've used in the past is, this is the hardware which flows from the, the Lisbon Treaty. Um, and I think Cathy Ashton can, with some pride, uh, say to her successor, whoever he or she may be, whenever he or she is appointed, uh, I have built you a machine that you can now put to the use that you, you think is, is most appropriate. And her successor will not have to spend a disproportionate amount of their political uh, and psychic energy uh, worrying about actually setting up the, the, the structures. So if I look at... Um, beyond the, the sort of building of the machine, uh, let me give you some examples of how I think we've been able to improve the way foreign policy shaping and implementation uh, uh, has improved over the last uh, four years. Firstly, I think the Foreign Affairs Council, which is now separate from the General Affairs Council, so we now have a dedicated Foreign Affairs Council, uh, has been much more proactive and responsive. Foreign ministers meet regularly, at least once every four weeks, sometimes more often. Uh, the High Representative sets the agenda, chairs the meetings. We've streamlined the preparatory process so that the Foreign Affairs Council is able to address all major foreign policy issues in real time, often, as I say, with extraordinary meetings or extra meetings, and generally a much more activist stance. Uh, let me give a few examples. Uh, we see real-time coordination of EU positions 
and a new awareness for the need to work in closer coordination. And even in cases of initial political disagreement, for example, in the earlier phases of the Lib Libya crisis when we had a, a hiccup at the UN Security Council that we all remember, closer interaction in the Foreign Affairs Council allowed us to share assessments and arrive at joint EU action, including the opening of our office in Benghazi, which was one of the first international missions established uh, in Libya after, after the conflict. Um, through the adoption of targeted smart sanctions, the EU has been able to give strong, unambiguous signals of EU unity in different crises. Belarus, Ivory Coast, Iran, Syria, Ukraine, and now Russia bringing our economic and technical strengths closer to foreign policy aims and forming the basis for international alliances with other, par other partners. Conversely, lifting the sanctions uh, on Myanmar, and we were one of the first to do that, showed also how we are willing and able to respond to accompany positive transformations. And Myanmar has been one of the good news stories uh, of the last couple of years, and I think the EU has played uh, a very important uh, lead role in facilitating that. Through close regular cooperation, a good understanding and a division of responsibilities has been achieved by foreign ministers, allowing the HR, the High Representative Vice President, to entrust missions to certain foreign ministers on her behalf and thereby multiplying our ability to act. Let me give one example which is sometimes quoted in the opposite direction. When we were still trying to mediate a solution at the beginning of the Ukrainian crisis on the 21st of February, uh, Kathy Ashton was chairing the Foreign Affairs Council in Brussels, adopting the legal instruments needed to impose sanctions on uh, the Yanukovych regime, uh, uh, particularly for those responsible for the violence in Maidan, while the foreign ministers of Poland, Germany and France were on the ground in Kiev negotiating on her behalf the agreement between the president and three opposition leaders. Now, many people have said to me, wait a minute, why were the Germans, the Poles, and the French there? Shouldn't Cathy Ashton have been there? Well, she could have been, except that we needed someone to chair the Foreign Affairs Council to adopt the sanctions that were, in fact, the pressure uh, on the government to do a deal with the, with the opposition. And, in fact, for me, it is the perfect demonstration of how we get a complementarity uh, between the, 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 the union level and the, the role, the continuing role, and it will continue for a very long time to be important of... Uh, uh, national diplomacy, sometimes acting individually, sometimes acting, as was the case uh, in, in Kiev on those days, uh, as, as a group of foreign ministers. And I can assure you that the phone calls between Cathy and the three ministers were happening literally every half hour to, to, to compare notes and to make sure that we were completely joined up between what was being decided in Brussels and what was being done on, on the ground. So it was, for me, a textbook illustration of how the, the Lisbon structures can deliver. Secondly, we're building a more joined-up policy making between Europe and the member states. Um, some very good examples here. The anti-piracy -pirac naval operation off the coast of Somalia is now fully a part of a more articulate engagement uh, with support to the African Union peacekeeping mission in Somalia, EU operations for the training of national security capacity, EU diplomatic presence, our development cooperation programs, and wider regional cooperation. So on the one hand, we have a very successful, if you like, repressive element, which is the naval activity, and it has significantly reduced incidences of piracy. Uh, and on the other hand, we're very well aware that it's not just repression or, or stopping it at the end. You have to move uh, upstream and see why young men jump onto speedboats with Kalashnikovs uh, and how you deal with the, 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 the problems at the origin uh, of, these, of these kind of symptoms. Uh, the success in the Kosovo-Serbia discussions, uh, showed very close cooperation between the Council and the Commission and the very important personal role of Cathy Ashton. Um, we have close cooperation with the United Nations in the region and close cooperation with the in wider international community from the United States even to Russia. Uh, and this shows how the stabilizing commitment or promise of EU membership can also help to bring about political change. The High Representative's role as Vice President of the Commission has ensured that there is a common purpose and shared understanding between the actions of the Council and initiatives considered, initiatives considered by the Commission. For example, discussions on energy security and energy diversification 
were promoted by Cathy Ashton and by the Energy Commissioner in the Foreign Affairs Council to help set new priorities. And you've seen the role that Commissioner Oettinger has played in trying to broker a deal between Russia and Ukraine uh, on, the, on the gas prices, uh, again demonstrating the complementarity uh, between uh, the role of the Commission and the uh, foreign policy dimension. And the, the, the new structures, in my view, make uh, this much more fluid than would have been the case uh, if we had not made those changes. Um, and I would like to say more generally, particularly in the presence of a few distinguished former members of the, the, the Department of Foreign Affairs here, that the, the whole reflex of the foreign policy community in Europe is now one of coordination at European level. This is the, the natural tendency of all foreign ministers. When there is a problem, the first thing they do is they ring Cathy and they say, Cathy, we need a, a European position. We need to react. Now, sometimes... They're doing it because it's an issue of particular domestic sensitivity, and therefore, uh, uh, you know, that's why they take the initiative. Sometimes it's an issue of such grave importance that it's obvious that we need to do something. But the, the, the mechanisms of European political cooperation, which I remember with great fondness when we used to travel around the, the capitals of the presidency because we couldn't meet in Brussels, because, of course, it was not a European competence foreign policy, uh, uh, and the attempts to craft common positions on an occasional UN resolution. When I look at where we have moved from then in the late 70s uh, to where we are now, it is a dramatic shift, a dramatic shift of a reflex of common European positions and trying to mobilize all the elements at our disposal from what the Commission can do, from what the Member States can contribute in terms of military assets or, or, or other contributions into a, a complete foreign policy uh, uh, set of to a toolbox. Um, I think we have been very uh, 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 focused on, on mediation. Uh, we are a, a regional integration organization and we speak and act on behalf of 28 members, but we don't represent a single country's viewpoint. We have access to military assets, uh, but we're not a military power. We have soft power instruments from sanctions to stabilization funds, from electoral observation to civilian administration reform. And with these assets and under the leadership of Cathy Ashton, the EU has increased its role as an international mediator and in consolidating and accompanying resolution to crisis. Our experience in these areas is growing, from chairing the Iran talks, where I think Cathy Ashton has done a remarkable job, the clock is ticking on the interim deal. Uh, she's heavily engaged uh, this week uh, in Vienna trying to transform the, the interim arrangement into a definitive arrangement. Uh, I think it's within grasp, but uh, it is challenging. Uh, to what we did in uh, accompanying change in, in Burma, Myanmar, from responding to the crisis in Mali in 2013, to our close engagement to help the political consolidation in Yemen, from the peace process in the Philippines to intervening with a stabilization military opera operation in Central African Republic. I think we've developed stronger partnerships with other actors, first and foremost with the UN, where the EU has obtained a stronger role in the General Assembly and in the Security Council, where it is now possible for Cathy Ashton and other EU actors actually to address the Security Council, something which was, would have been thought inconceivable uh, not so long ago. Uh, and Cathy has in-depth exchange of views with the Security Council once a year uh, and consultations between the EU and the UN before and during peacekeeping operations or crisis management missions are now part of a new routine. We have a long-standing cooperation with NATO based on the Berlin Plus arrangements dating back to 2003. We share intelligence. We can use NATO capabilities for EU-led civil and military operations. We've launched two uh, common security and defense policy missions under Berlin Plus, Concordia in Firum, and U4 Altea in Bosnia-Herzegovina. It is, of course, not a secret to say that the tension over the Turkish-Cypriot, uh, Turkey and Cyprus problem does inhibit uh, our ability to, to uh, have the, the kind of cooperation that maybe both sides would, would wish. Uh, but I think despite these limitations, formal and informal interactions at political and senior official level have proven beneficial to both organizations. The transatlantic relationship has also been strengthened. Uh, I think Cathy's personal relationship both with Hillary Clinton and with John Kerry have played a very important role, but the, there is almost daily process of, of consultation and coordination between the External Action Service uh, and the State Department. 
uh, and many face-to-face -face meetings uh, coordinating our joint response to developments on, on uh, all major international uh, uh, crisis spots. Just to, for the sake of completeness, because of course the problem is when you give a list in this kind of speech, someone stands up at the end and says, you didn't mention uh, uh, such and such a country. Uh, I think uh, our relations with Asia have developed considerably over the last four years. We had a very important visit of uh, the Chinese President uh, Xi Jinping to Brussels, the first visit ever of a Chinese President to the European institutions, uh, followed closely by a visit of uh, Prime Minister Abe. Uh, uh, and we have broadened considerably the agenda of our discussions with uh, our Asian partners to include security, security issues. We've had joint naval operations off Somalia with China and are about to do the same with Japan. And we've considerably strengthened our cooperation with ASEAN, uh, also in the, in the area of uh, security cooperation. Um, my speech here says the results are not always commensurate with our efforts. Yes, I suppose that's, that is true, actually. Um, it then says, with an exclamation mark, but that's diplomacy for you. <laughs> and, and that's probably also true. Uh, uh, the, the, the limits of, of what diplomatic uh, activity can actually achieve uh, on the ground are, are considerable, and we have to recognize that. Uh, and this is true of European policy. It's true of any national policy. Uh, I suspect it's even true for a superpower like the United States uh, that uh, you, know, you can start out with a great plan of how you want to influence events around the world, but at the end of the day, people are people, uh, uh, and the dynamics of uh, regional and uh, national situations have their own logic at times, which escape uh, even the cleverest of diplomatic activity. Um, so my message really is that I think we've done a lot over the last four years. I think we've built a machine and we've put it to, to fairly good use. As always, the challenge is whether we're moving as quickly as external events uh, would require. And there I continue to believe that we, are, we have a tendency to be just slightly behind the curve uh, because we still uh, are a bit slow uh, and we still haven't fully figured out just how much of foreign policy we really want decided and implemented at European level and how much we want reserved for space for, for national uh, activity. And it's a very legitimate and important debate. But I, my sincere hope is that in the discussions now taking place in Brussels around the selection of the, the new leadership, President of the European Council, President of the Commission, new High Representative Vice President, in the concept of setting an agenda for the next five years in response to some of the concerns that come through from the results of the European Parliament elections, that in this there will be a clear commitment to more European action in the foreign policy field. Uh, we cannot be a spectator uh, to these unfolding international events. We are a stakeholder, uh, we have interests, we have values, uh, and we need to be active in the defense of our uh, interests and in the projection of our values. Uh, otherwise, we will find ourselves at the receiving end of a world shaped by, by other forces, and many of which will not be exactly to, to our liking. So I hope that this will find uh, a new impetus or an additional impetus uh, in the coming years and that the foreign policy agenda will, will grow and develop along with the rest of, of the Union's agenda uh, by trying to address the concerns of our citizens. Thank you very much indeed.